Silence is the time to start. But I've got to wait for Mary to give me the thumbs up. Testing, testing. Thumbs up. Right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Tim Boson, and tonight I'm going to be talking about Byzantine art. Um, it's the first of three series. So tonight we're talking about early Byzantine art. But before I get onto that, I just want to test <laughs> whether my thing works. It does. Oh, no, go back. I just want to give a little thank you. Now, some of you will know that I'm chair of an organization called Conservation 50. Conservation 50 formed in 2019 to mark the fact that we have 50 years of conservation in St. Albans. When we'd done our various events, which was a conference, an exhibition, and a children's competition, when those were over, we were having such a good time, we didn't want to give up. And of course, conservation doesn't go away, it actually increases. So we set about what we could do. And one of the things that I was saying to Mary tonight just came into my mind was there was this area next door to the Verdun tree, a commemorative bench to the end of the First World War. And there was this space in this rather nice area down Wax House Gate. <clears throat> so I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a bench there? And I did some investigations and came up with a peace bench. The peace bench was just fitted just a couple of weeks ago. Um, rather awful in a way, because of course we're in the middle of a war and don't we need peace? Um, but the good news is uh, that the dean, the new dean here, will be blessing that bench. So when I get the date, look out for it. It'll be open to every member of the public to come along and the peace bench will be blessed. And if you haven't been to that area, Wax House Gate, do go. It's a lovely little area, the garden behind. You've got the restaurant Lussmann's the other side. And now you've got two places to sit, one commemorating the end of the war and the other I hope in the future celebrating peace. My thank you is because the talks that I've given here and my thanks to the cathedral and to Mary and all the colleagues who work so hard, what I've done is I put my fee into the peace bench. So that's where it's gone. And I've also started raising funds for something else. Some of you may know about this lady. You can't see, sorry, get out of the way. Um, I'm going, to use, I'm going to use a pointer. Are you all right now? I do move around a lot, so just tell me if I'm in the way. Um, let's go back or forward. This, this lady here is a succubus. Uh, some of you, uh, some of the men may know about succubus. Uh, they're ladies who come to you in the night and demand some sexual favors from you. Um, because it's very leg legend idea. And ladies, don't worry, there's also an incubus, the male equivalent, who comes to you at night. Now, there, this succubus is a, a wooden bracket at the end of the entrance to what was the stables of Christopher Inn. That's the only sort of surviving bit of the stables as you go in. And this succubus was up there in the corner, rather neglected, not in a very good state. And there are very few of them. There's one in Cambridge, some of you may know about more than Street, and there's one in Colchester, but they're few and far between. This succubus got a bad reputation in the 19th century because the landlord of the Christopher Inn was twice prosecuted in the courts, we have the records, for keeping a bawdy house. So this symbol might have indicated something else as well as protection for the male sleeper. It may have offered some entertainment for a male sleeper. Anyway, she's a rare lady. She's not been very well looked after. She is owned by the council and they have given me permission to have her conserved. So I raised some funds. And again, if you gave money, thank you very much. And if you didn't give money, you can still give money because, because when the report comes through, obviously then the conservation will have to start. She does need looking after. She was overpainted at some point and the paint has cracked and the damp has got in. So poor lady is not in a happy condition and we need to sort her out. Anyway, that was my little thank you to all of those who've contributed. Now we get down to the serious business. Byzantine art. Some of you will know about Byzantium Empire. Um, it's a made up name because it didn't really exist. It was the Roman Empire, the 
East Roman Empire, and the people who lived in it call themselves Romaio. They were Romans. They thought of themselves as Romans. But as we shall see, the culture that developed in the Eastern Roman Empire was really a Greek culture. And so it was more, rather more Hellenized, more Greek than it was Westernized. And it embodied that Greek culture right the way through its existence. And of course, it existed, um, as we shall see now, from basically 330 right the way down to 1453, conquest by uh, Mehmed II of Constantinople. But they never thought of themselves in those periods. And I've divided it following the traditional division, which is early, middle, and late. But it's quite artificial in many ways. So I'm going to take you through. But before I do, I want you to understand why in the British education system, no one knows much about Byzantium until recently. Um, I'm going to read you. This is, some of you may know this, this is a, an excerpt from William Edward Hartpole Leckie. William Hartpole Leckie was um, a moral historian. And he wrote the history of European morals from Augustus to Charlemagne, 1869, right? The Byzantine Empire was preeminently the age of treachery. Its vices were the vices of men who had ceased to be brave without learning to be virtuous, without patriotism, without the fruition or desire of liberty, after the first paroxysms of religious agitation, without genius or intellectual activity, slaves and willing slaves in both their actions and their thoughts, immersed in sensuality and in the most frivolous pleasures. The people only emerged from their listlessness when some theological subtlety or some rivalry at the chariot races stimulated them into frantic riots. The history of the empire is a monotonous story of the intrigues of priests, gets worse, women, eunuchs, of poisonings, of conspiracies, of uniform ingratitude, of perpetual fratricides. Now, that was a 19th century view of Byzantium, little known. And of course, there was a big reaction to Edward Gibbon, who had been so anti-Christian and anti-religious in his accounts. So he was put to one side. So the real prejudice against Byzantium, of course, a lot of it was they were the wrong religion. They were schematics. They were orthodox rather than Catholics. So they were the wrong side. Interestingly enough, I was doing some research at some point into, because I have some friends from the Balkans here tonight, some research into Bosnia and the Austrian census that they took place just before the First World War. And of course you remember, the First World War was triggered by what happened in Sarajevo with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Just before that, there was a census. And in the census, they had Catholics, Muslims, and schematics. They weren't called orthodox, they were schematics. So the prejudice is deeply there. And to understand about Byzantium was actually quite tricky. It wasn't in the normal civilis. Roman Empire, that was good, but it stopped. We didn't even get much into the third century because things started going downhill. Um, so there's been that prejudice against Byzantine art, and certainly Byzantium in that sense was seen quite different from the West. And there were, of course, the various clashes through the church, breakaway of the church, uh, but also the Crusaders going and not thinking much of the Byzantines themselves. Um, people like Bohemond, who set up his kingdom in Antioch, very rude about the Byzantines and the Western chroniclers don't like them much, too devious, too Greek, and so on. So that's the prejudice we have to work against. But when we come to the Byzantine art, we'll see that actually it offers something quite glorious, something very colorful, something quite mystical and quite magical, very different from the classical Renaissance traditions, which have tended to dominate art uh, ever since the uh, 16th century. So that's what we'll come on to. Now, tonight, this is a bit of nostalgia for me tonight because, as I was saying earlier to uh, an old colleague of mine, Valerie, I used to teach Byzantine art at Queen's University in Belfast. Now, I wasn't a regular member of the Queen's staff. I was invited in by my friend who happened to run the Byzantine Centre, and they had no art historian. 
So I would go across, always the winter term, during the troubles, <laughs> you can imagine what it was like, but we lived in South Belfast. Every night I had to suffer bush mills being poured down my throat. Now, some of you will know what bush mills is, famous Northern Irish whiskey, and couldn't get to bed until two o'clock because it was like that need from someone outside to come in. So I just have very pleasant, slightly hazy memories of teaching Byzantine art in, in Belfast. So you're going to get roughly that, except of course, when I was teaching it, it was old slides, it wasn't digital, and lots of things have happened since then. So, but for me, this is a nostalgic trip. Right, on we go. We start with Constantine the Great. And Constantine, in a sense, is the beginning, and some historians, of course, think he's the beginning of the Christianization of the world. He's the beginning of the Byzantine Empire, though, of course, he didn't know that. Constantine, um, well, let's look at him in terms of the art we've got here. And I'm not sure if you can see with that. I might use a physical pointer because that might be easier for you to actually see it. This is Constantine. Here he is, now in the National Museum. Um, I'm going to tell you an anecdote because I believe anecdotes are always interesting when I'm telling them anyway. Um, years and years ago, I did an exhibition, a Byzantine exhibition. Um, and it made quite a splash actually because there hadn't been many Byzantine exhibitions. And most of the material was borrowed either from um, the British Museum or the Victorian Albert or from private uh, collectors. But I was passing the Yugoslav tourist office in Regent Street. Some of you may remember that. Um, oh, go back, sorry. Press that by accident. Um, and in the window was Constantine, not the original, I'm afraid. Anyway, I went in and said, can I borrow your head of Constantine? Because it would just be a nice opening to this exhibition. And so they lent me the head of Constantine. I did give it back, sadly. If I'd known what was gonna happen, I would have held on to it. But there he is. Now compare him to Augustus, the founder, you might say, of the Roman Empire. Augustus, the first Roman emperor, here is a wonderful bronze head, which is in the British Museum. Good story to this, found in uh, Northern Sudan in Meroe. Uh, we don't know, but we think probably there was a raid on uh, Southern Egypt where the cataracts were. We know from one of our sources, Strabo, that there was a sculpture there. We think they probably headhunted, took the head back um, as a trophy. And there it ends up in Northern Sudan. But there he is, lovely bronze, slightly starry eyes, but very nice. Um, but this is the classical form. Here he is looking young, um, perfect proportions and so on. Just look at the comparison. What's Constantine doing? He's looking at us, staring us out and slightly distorted, particularly those things they, again and again, you'll find if you want to make someone look very exceptional, show the whites of their eyes underneath. And that's, um, Abnormal. Anybody here got that particular condition? No, good, I'm safe then. Um, so we're already seeing something which is engaging us in a way which is not supposed to be realistic. This is what we would call hieratic art after the hieroglyphs. It's about a message to us. I'm watching you, I'm in charge, be careful. And this is of course what was happening at what we call the late antique period. Some of you may have been to my pagan to Christian talk where we talked about how the style started to change. So there's Constantine in that comparison. Interestingly, in terms of his religious conversion too, he was a practical man in all sorts of ways. And if you look here, this wonderful uh, gold medallion, well, it's nine pieces of the standard gold coin, the solidus, nine pieces of them. You will see that behind him is a figure. This says, by the way, uh, victorious Constantine, Max, and Augustus Didi. So the figure behind is a pagan god, Sol Invictus. And we know that he was very interested in Sol Invictus Constantine before he shifted his loyalty to Christianity. This medallion here, just a couple of years later, and his headdress here and his helmet is a Cairo, the symbol, the Christian symbol. 
So that time he's shifting, and it's probably because he's using religion in his wars to become the sole emperor. And this is what he does, an amazing achievement, really. Prior to Constantine, there had been a tetrarchy of emperors. Diocletian had organized the tetrarchy. Remember Diocletian from Split? And <laughs> Looking at my wife, who's from Split. That's why I love So um, four emperors, the empire divided up. And in fact, it really fell into uh, these different areas. Constantine was taken by Diocletian to his capital in Asia, Nicomedia here, not actually marked on this map, as a hostage essentially for the good behavior of his father, Constantius, who was beating up the Brits, campaign actually up in Scotland. What Constantine did was slipped away, got on a horse and used the famous Roman post system. And in a week, went all the way across Europe to join his father in York. Hadn't got there long when his father died. And the troops, no doubt with a little bit of help, a bit of bribery, decided to vote him as Augustus, much to the chagrin of all the other emperors and the tetrarchy and the way it had been set up. But slowly but surely, as this map indicates, he moved across, defeating, defeating his enemies, defeating the last enemy, Licinius, he defeated, and he'd reached Asian part, and where was he based? In a small, originally Greek city of Byzantium. What he decided to do was turn Byzantium into his new Christian capital. He called it New Rome. So here's an aerial view of it today. And you can see from this map here how strategically clever it was. Asia here. Europe here, the Golden Horn protecting it, so protected on three sides by water, and he originally built a wall here, and then later the famous Theodosian second wall, um, Theodosius II's walls were built. So he founded his new capital and called it New Rome. To distinguish it from Rome, where the crusty old senators were still pagans, he had a new Christian capital, and he filled it with treasures looted from everywhere. <laughs> he went around the empire looting to build it up. Um, and its citizens soon started calling it Constantinople. It's Constantine city, so Constantinople. So we'll come back to Constantinople. I put this one in because this is the only map we've got of what Constantinople looked like before the Ottoman conquest in 1453. So that's the only map we've got. Um, showing it, 1422, you'll see. And it gives you an idea on how it had actually expanded across to Galatea here, the Galata Bridge, and so on, with the column. Um, strategically, an amazing place. And when you think about Lecky's description of this terrible place, you would think, well, it collapse over a thousand years of empire based on Constantinople, which is amazing that it survived so long. It's already a religious place. Everything is about religion. Constantine is called the vicar of God, the vicegerent of God, and all the emperors follow that on. So they have a divine relationship. And the emperors were really the most important religious person. Yes, they appointed patriarchs later on, but the patriarchs had to kowtow to the emperor. Does this remind you of the Orthodox Church somewhere close today, where the patriarch, Kirill, has to kowtow to lifelong President Putin? So, and well, later on, of course, we'll actually investigate that relationship between what is Kyiv, the Russian princes, and Byzantium, and the whole mechanism. Some of you may have read my article about it, on my blog site. If you haven't, I recommend it. <laughs> so we're not going to stay there, though. We're going to follow the art now, and we're going actually into Greece. We're going to Thessaloniki. The reason we have to go to Thessaloniki 
is for twofold. One is in Constantinople, the head of this religious center, we find two things that have in a way got rid of all the early Byzantine art. One is self-inflicted, which is the period of iconoclasm, which was where we'll end tonight. And the other, of course, is the Fourth Crusade, 1204, which meant a lot of Byzantine things end up in Venice um, with the Crusaders when they sack Constantinople in 1204. And then finally, of course, the conquest by the Ottomans. So a lot of the early art just hasn't existed. Fortunately, some of the later art has survived in very limited areas. So we need to go to Greece. And we're going to look at three monuments here. Or well, I should say we're visiting four places tonight. Constantinople, Thessaloniki, and two more exciting places to come. One of you will already guess. So we're going to look at the mausoleum of Galeris, the rotunda, which got converted into a church. We're going to look at Hosios Davidos, David. And we're going to look at, uh, well, we're not going to look at Hyas Demetrios tonight, actually. That's going to be for next talk. Now, let's go to the mausoleum of Galeris. Roman emperors like to have a large uh, mausoleums, and the ideal site for a mausoleum was to have your sarcophagus in the center and people could parade around you. So there were centrally planned buildings. So they weren't designed initially as churches for worship, but we'll come on to the centrally planned, build, uh, planned building. So this is very much in the Augustian tradition. Uh, probably some of you have been to the one in Hadrian in Rome. Um, circular, wonderful dome. And fortunately, some of the mosaics have survived from the late fourth century when it was converted into a church. When Galerius died, he was emperor who was looking after that area of Greece and the Balkans. When he died, he wasn't brought back to Thessaloniki, although it had been his base, and he was buried in Serbia. Um, so this remained empty. Theodosius II, Byzantine emperor, said, let's do something with it, and they decorated it. And we're going to have a look at the decoration. So circular plan, you can see what survived in this tremendous dome. But what's interesting, is about the mosaic work. This heralds Byzantine mosaics. What's going to happen? We're going to have lots of gold, have lots of color. We're going to have lots of figures standing, looking at us, presenting to us, almost floating as they look at us because they are signaling something. But notice here, there's still some classical elements. They're not looking as straight, they're looking as slightly. This is a couple of martyrs, um, Basilicus, who was the bishop of Amasia and had a sticky end. And Priscus from Phrygia also had a sticky end. Early Christianity is celebrating all the time those who have suffered as martyrs. But look at the architectural background and the elaborateness of these mosaics. Now, this is following a Roman tradition. Some of you will probably have been to Pompeii and you will have seen some of the frescoes there that have survived. This is just outside Pompeii at a wonderful villa at Boscoriali, and look at the architectural features. Now, what is interesting for us, of course, is that they had understood the vanishing point, which disappeared essentially during medieval art and had to be re rediscovered in the Renaissance. So this is a classical backdrop, very typical of what you find in Roman rooms, the idea of the architecture behind giving you a screen. So if we go back, you can see you've got the same idea, except here, of course, we have a dove, a Christian symbol, um, but the rest is very similar to the idea of the architectural background, framing the person. And if you look at the mosaics themselves, how wonderfully colorific they are, and notice what I was saying about the eyes again, the whites of the eyes, uh, much more soft, classical head we're getting than we will get later on as Byzantium becomes stricter and more fundamental. But look at these lovely decorations. It's animals and uh, fruit and so on. Uh, all these gold mosaics, the little pieces you probably know called tessera, this was four, just literally meaning four sides. Um, so this is still holding on to quite a lot of the classical traditions that moves into uh, Byzantine art. And very similar, if we go up to 
uh, Hosios Davidos, David, Hosios David, fifth century, a little church, which was part of the Lotomos monastery. And what's interesting about this is the apse mosaic here. And we'll have to look at that in detail. Here, of course, we have the iconostasis screening off the sacrum from the rest of the church. And you can see it's only a little tiny little church with this little bit add, added later. But the mosaic is quite stunning. I don't know how well you can see the colors with this light, but it's, it's very soft, but vibrant colors. And what it shows is uh, a theophany. This is, and I'll, I'll read this out in case you can't see it back there, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it, and in its midst something in glowing metal. In the midst of the fire, strange beasts with four wings and four faces, a series of sparkling wheels and expanse above the creatures, stretched out wings and a throne occupied by a fiery human form. Well, this is, of course, from Ezekiel, but actually what we've got is this converted to the Christian revelation of Christ. So you've got the four animals now representing the evangelists. So you've got Mark down here, and you can probably see him with his gospels there. You've got Matthew up here, the human head. You've got uh, Luke down here. And you've got John there. So there they all are, holding their gospels. And here over here is Ezekiel, looking horrified. We'll look at him in detail in a moment. And over here, you've got Habakkuk. Now look at the Jesus figure, dressed in purple like an emperor, young, beardless, um, hailing us, riding on that rainbow coming through the clouds. So this is what the monks would see at each service, Jesus coming to them. Um, and if we look at a close-up of the mosaic, you can see here's Ezekiel, almost hands in horror, um, a beautifully composed mosaic with a sort of sketchy land behind. And through the early Byzantine period, the mosaics are still ground their human figures. As we move further forward into the middle Byzantine period, they're not grounded at all. It's as if they're totally floating. Now, I just wanted to show you this, how the empire waxes and wanes, because we're going to see a bit of waxing in a minute. Waning again. I'll let it run through so, so, so you can get a sense of it. But it gives you that huge time span, massive time span, and the empire generally shrinking, but sometimes expanding. A constant battle of survival. Mainly, of course, against the forces of the East, Islam, and the empires. So this is just after Constantine, but as we move forward, this is the one we want to look at because it's the time of Justinian I. And Justinian, great emperor, Justinian the Great, expands the empire, bringing back some of the Western areas, some of the Western provinces back into his control. So essentially he starts off with this bit here and he brings back North Africa. He brings back a little tiny bit of Spain and very importantly, he brings back Italy into the empire, into the Roman Empire. And of course, you can tell where we're going to go now. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time there, Ravenna. Ravenna uh, was founded as an important strategic port by the Emperor Honorius, a Western Emperor, when Rome had really lost its significance and wasn't near the frontiers and had been sacked a couple of times. First. Um, by the Goths and then by the Vandals. So 410 and 450. So when he brings back Italy into the empire, he wants somewhere where there's a good port, where there's good communication between Italy and Constantinople. And he chooses Ravenna because it's also near the frontier here to deal with the Germans, the Goths, and in particular, of course, building up at that time, the Lombards who eventually, in the end, take over uh, Italy. Now, 
He does a lot in Constantinople. And one of the most famous things he does, which I'm sure you all know about, and we're going to look at at some point, is the church or cathedral of St. Sophia. And he has a very tricky moment. It's not plain sailing for uh, Justinian. Um, in 531, there's a riot at the Hippodrome. Lecky's disparaging remarks about chariot racing are not entirely wrong in that the citizens of Constantinople become consumed with the blues and the greens who race. Now, those who know your Roman history will remember there were whites and reds. Well, by the time they got to Constantinople, they'd gone. And there were just two teams. And the two teams, a bit like, um, I say you could say, Manchester City or Manchester United or Liverpool and Everton or Chelsea and Arsenal, it goes on and on. They represent two opposing forces, often politically as well. One on the side of the emperor, the one against. You have to remember emperors in Rome were not hereditary. They were supposed to be the best person for it. So there was always competition. They could always be overthrown in a way that a hereditary system is much more difficult to overthrow because there's a bloodline. Not so with Roman emperors. Though, of course, often they wanted their sons to inherit that power. And of course, by their sons inheriting, it also guaranteed them, should they live that long, which generally they didn't, um, a, a good retirement. And so uh, we're going to look at uh, St. Sophia, and we're going to look at the palace next door to the Hippodrome where the riot broke out because the two were linked. And there are some surviving mosaics from the palace. But the, I suppose the most amazing and fantastic building of all Byzantium was the Hagia Sophia, uh, an extraordinary building, just amazing in its time. And of course, still there. Some of you will know that um, Last year, the Turkish president, Erdogan, turned it back into a mosque from being a museum. Um, Kemal Ataturk, at the time of the foundation of the Republic, tried to remove religion from a lot of areas and secularize things. And the Sophia became a museum. Um, Erdogan, who's riding on the back of popularism, like a few other dictators we know about, another president for life, interestingly enough, um, turned it back for his right-wing followers into a mosque. Uh, if you can cut away the minarets and you cut away the tombs out here, you've got the basic structure, but it's a fantastic building. How many have you been to the Hagia Sophia? I see quite a lot of you, yes. Isn't it wonderful, amazing, uh, and extraordinary for its time? No dome could surpass it until Michelangelo's St. Peter's. Think of that time spread. It was just so special. Here's the interior, trying to capture it. Uh, quiz question, how wide is the dome? We'll do meters because we're EU friendly here. 33 meters wide. So it's absolutely massive. And it collapsed, of course, on several occasions because uh, Constantinople or Istanbul, if you want to call it by its modern name, is on a fracture line. and a, so. Uh, earthquakes do happen there. This is as it was as a museum, uh, maintaining the um, Arabic discs to Muhammad, but at the same time, uh, not holding services there and being seen as a museum. All of this uh, is a later decoration, of course, but we will, in the next talk, be looking at some of the mosaics which survived under the whitewash and the coloring. Just to look at its structure is quite extraordinary. Um, of course, put together as we saw by two mathematicians. Um, what it does, it takes the basilical form here, but actually then puts a dome on top of it. And it's able to do this by a clever little architectural feature, which really hadn't been used before at all. If you think of the rotunda we looked at for Galerius, or you think of the Pantheon, or you think of Augustus, they hadn't really used this at all. In fact, I hadn't used it. It's the pendentive. And it's a pendentive is just a triangular a section of a sphere. Very simple device, but it created the ability to then 
have centrally planned buildings. And most of you will know Orthodox churches generally tend to be centrally planned rather than Western churches, which tend to be like our cathedral here, a basilica, which has aisles and naves. So that was an astonishing piece of uh, architecture to bring that together. And inside it was decorated as if it was another place, the other place, heaven. And many of you will know the story, of course, because now it's because poor old heaves in the news so much. Vladimir sent his emissaries to look at the religions around the world. He wanted to move away from paganism to have a monotheistic religion. Should he go to Islam? Should he go to the Catholic West? Should he go to Byzantium? And the story is, apocryphal it may be, but the story is that his emissaries were so amazed when they went into the Iosiphia because they looked up the dazzling mosaics, the huge space, they said, this is heaven, this is heaven. And the idea was that when the emperor went through the royal door here, huge door, he was entering into the other world as the vicar of God into heaven. So everything in Byzantium has this amazing religious connotation. And what you can't see very well here though is these are split marble panels, beautifully done. And then look at the capitals um, that Justin had had with his monogram, amazing drilled capitals, fantastic craftsmanship and an amazing building. Um, and still there standing today, even though sadly, as I say, it's being converted into a mosque. Now, the other thing I mentioned, here's the Sophia up here. Here's the Hippodrome where the, the so-called Nikar riots took place between the blues and the greens, and they nearly toppled Justinian. And the story goes that he was ready to set sail and leave Constantinople when his wife, Theodora, the notorious Theodora, um, and that's really for Byzantine history rather than art, the notorious Theodora persuaded him to stay and fight it out. Theodora, of course, was supposed to be the bear keeper's daughter and another thing on the side, which we won't mention, and had a notorious reputation. But we have to remember that our source for this was a man called Procopius, who wrote perfectly ordinary history and then wrote an absolute defamatory attack on Justinian and in particular on Theodora. So Theodora did all the things that you shouldn't do. Um, but perhaps we take some of that with a pinch of salt. But next door is the palace and there was a direct communication. That's how important the Hippodrome was because of course that's where you could see all your people. That's where you could present yourself and people could see you. Just surviving underneath are some of the mosaics from the palace. They may be the time of Justinian, they may be slightly later, we're not sure. There's some dispute about uh, their actual dating. But as you can see, they're still very classical and naturalistic. This head, sometimes called the head of a barbarian, but more probably a seasonal head, the coloring and the, the face, beautifully proportioned, delicately done. And this wonderful scene here of an eagle fighting a snake, very naturalistic. And that's in a sense the last bits of naturalism we're likely to see. There's very little secular art from Byzantium because of its uh, where it hasn't survived, but also because of the nature of the state. It was said, and we actually got uh, stamps, bread stamps, that even the bread had a religious slogan stamped onto it. So when you went and bought your bread in the morning, you were reminded that this was a Christian uh, place. Now we're off to Ravenna. Uh, how many of you have been to Ravenna? Yes, fantastic, isn't it? An amazing mosaics we're going to see in Ravenna. And after uh, the conquest, and you see the conquest of Ravenna took place in the 540s, uh, Justinian sets up his center there, the Exarchate it's called, and his most senior administrator lives in Ravenna. Ravenna was, and uh, it's not quite clear today that there is a very important port here, but the sea came much closer in. So it was right on the sea in the ancient times. So it was a, a really important port. And of course, later on, we think of how when the Lombards came, uh, of course, the citizens retreated up into to Venice where they had the protection of the lagoon. So this is Ravenna. And we're going to look at, we can't look at everything in Ravenna. It's just, there's 
too much to see, but we're going to look at the main things, which of course are San Vitale, very important, and Apollo Nari Nuovo. Uh, and we're not going to look, I'm afraid, today at the, um, at the oh, sorry, Apollo Nari Nuovo there. We're not going to look at the baptistries, which are marked. Um, I had to leave something out, otherwise you'd be here until midnight. Right. We're going to start with the Polonara Nuove at its first stage. And this is interesting because this church was started under the Ostrogothic king, Theodoric. The Ostrogothic king had worked for the Romans and then took over uh, when the last Roman emperor, 475, was deposed. And he ruled um, in Ravenna and the northern part of Italy. Now, he was a Christian, but he was the wrong sort of Christian. Does anyone know what Christian he was? He was an Arian, yes, an Arian. Um, and therefore, he was a monophysite. Um, and he thought there was a time when there was a distinct distinction between God and Jesus, the man part and the God part. Because rationally, the Arians based their thinking on Greek philosophy, and rationally that couldn't work out. However, of course, the Catholic view, which was they were so combined, we, too humble, unimportant, to be able to distinguish between, but we know that they're combined. So he was an Arian, whereas Justinian was what we would now call an Orthodox. So this church was started under an Arian, and it has, probably can't see it terribly well, but the, it's a basilical church, and each side of the nave, you have um, processions. On the north side, you have these female saints ending up with the three magi and the enthroned virgin. And on the southern side, you have Jesus enthroned here and you have male saints. And here at the end, you have a palace and it's labeled for us. And this is really interesting because it's just one of those little odd things that we'll come across. We'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. This is the close up of the three magi and you can see how wonderful the colors are, the craftsmanship that's got into it, but they're looking sideways. They're not looking at us. And this is fundamentally different from what we're going to see for the rest of Byzantine art. When anyone is presented to us, they will look at us and engage us. Not as if we're part of them, but as if they're communicating with us. So there's the three magi, say beautifully, beautifully done. And quite, again, quite, uh, Figurative and classical in the way they're presented with palm trees at the back. And if we look at the palace, just another architectural feature, but those of you with really good eyesight, you'll see a hand here, an arm and a hand here, and another hand over here. So what's happened? Well, what we think happened is this was built by Theodoric and he was going to be sitting here, gazing out at us. But when Justinian comes and reclaims Ravenna back, Italy back for the Byzantine Empire, he's removed. And that, that's the standard classical tradition, of course, to actually alter sculptures or remove sculptures of the previous rulers. And particularly being an Aryan, he's gone. So that is an early part, but we do know that other parts, and I mentioned the enthroned figures, and we'll look at those again in more detail, were put in later, after Justinian. Had reconquered. But the, the most amazing of all the churches is this centrally planned church to San Vitale. Uh, this is the brick outside, which was clearly in the past clad, mainly clad with marble, but that's all been stripped off. But it's the inside that is most interesting. And you can compare it here, the centrally planned building compared with the basilical type, the standard Western church. So we're going to be looking here at uh, the apse and two areas and the choir, and we'll look at the mosaics there. This is the view you get, and it's quite tricky to get a good photograph, but we're looking up through the choir. You can see this amazing roof, and you can see the apse there and the side panels. Look at the roof now. This is clearly still within a very classical tradition, masses of vegetation curling around and in the center, the Lamb of God held up by four uh, 
we presume archangels holding them up. Astonishing piece of craftsmanship. But you see how all this floral decoration, the peacocks, how that's within the tradition. And the mosaicists are following that tradition. And even the apse, we have a youthful Jesus um, handing out the martyr's crown to St. Vitalis. And uh, over here, the bishop Ecclesius, who built the church being celebrated between two angels. So he's floating on the globe. But you see again this sort of attempt at grounding them with flowers and rocks. And it's even got its clouds, not incredibly realistic, but nevertheless uh, giving it some grounding. And if we compare this useful Jesus in the apse there, and then we compare it to the Jesus in San Apollonarovil, um, which, uh, which of course was much later, you can see that from he's gazing sideways slightly, now he's gazing at us. And he's moved from the good shepherd to the Pantocrator, a ruler, a man in charge, the Zeus-like figure, the controlling figure, the powerful figure. And that's the way Byzantine art moves. It moves from depicting something to commanding us and controlling us. The side panels are interesting too because they're all about uh, sacrifice. This is in the choir. And here we've got the sacrifices of Abraham. Abraham with the mysterious three angels who come to dine with him. And he has to, and I love the way he serves things. Wouldn't go down well in MasterChef. You could not get a whole piece of beef or cow on a platter, could you, just like that? Hasn't even bothered to cut it up. I mean, outrageous. Um, if you could see. <laughs> and over here, of course, the sacrifice of Isaac and the hand of God stopping it. But it's still quite naturalistic. And I love the way that we've got a tree, a little plants, um, we've got all the birds. It's nature's there. And not, as I say, totally realistic, but nevertheless giving us that, that sort of feeling. And then uh, up above, we've got um, Jeremiah. The other side, we have Moses and Isaiah. And we have, again, the theme of sacrifice, Abel sacrificing, and Melchizedek giving his offering to God out of the Old, both out of the Old Testament. So these are panels to teach us. And one of the things that Byzantine art does as well, it's didactic as well as being authoritative. So it's communicating with us about what happened, in this case, the Old Testament, but often it can be about the New Testament and miracles. It's telling us as parishioners, as citizens, this is what happened. But at the same time, it wants to stamp authority on us. The archway has some authority of Christ right at the apex, and then all the saints from Peter down. And you can see the quality of the mosaics again. This is uh, Andrew, Andreas, and you can see the quality of the mosaics. But again, notice the staring eyes, they're confronting us. And then it becomes even more powerful. And you'll remember this panel in the apps. Here is the emperor himself. We are being confronted by him. And he's looking at us. He is actually processing, of course, with the bread for the communion. And he's been led, and this is really interesting in how you convey authority within works of art. At the front are the church people. Maximianus, the bishop at that time. So it's later than Ecclesius, who's died. This mosaic is later, and you can tell that it's later in terms of the authority. The two archdeacons, this mysterious figure at the back, who is probably the donor, John Argentarius, though we can't be certain. But look, although Maximian is in front with his feet, who's in front here with his purple boots, a sign of being an emperor, purple cloak, gold, his crown, and the halo. So he's got all the religious paraphernalia, all the symbols of power he's presenting to us. This is the emperor. And next door to him, we think, though again, we can't be certain, 
These are his two generals, Belisarius and Narses, and the Gothic bodyguard was in the tradition of the Byzantine emperors to have their bodyguards from another ethnic group as protection. And just in the same way that was carried on, of course, by the Ottoman sultans, when they had Christian youths converted to Islam as the Janissaries. This is a way of getting, because uh, they, they don't have loyalty to another member of the family or another clique within the ruling group. So get someone from outside. And of course the Athenian, uh, they, had, uh, they had Thracians as their policemen. Uh, so that was the idea. You have someone different to control. Um, so there's the, the Goths with their lovely um, headdresses, uh, sorry, their, their necklaces and um, their Cairo on their shield to show that they've been converted, their spears. Um, it's a very authoritative piece. He's commanding us, gazing at us intently. And the other side, of course, is Theodora. There she is in all her richness, gazing out at us, wonderful crown with all the pearls, literally dripping. And she has a purple cloak with the three magi, repeating that scene of the magi bringing their gifts as if she is Mary, getting the gifts. Extraordinary conceit, isn't it? Um, and how wonderful ladies in waiting, all richly apparelled, uh, amazing. And an administrator, possibly even a palace eunuch, showing her the way with a little fountain. These are pieces that symbolize that transition, I think. And it's always tricky because it is a process rather than a complete cutoff. But this is now truly Byzantine art. This is what it's about engagement with us. And I wanted to put this back from Apollinari Novo because uh, this is the, probably after around 561. This is the way the Virgin is presented to us. Theotokos, she's bearing Jesus, the baby who is not a baby, but a young miniature adult, because you can't show God as a helpless baby. Babies are helpless, screaming and bawling and awful. So we have to have a baby that's already got huge authority, even though quite small. <laughs> and in purple, again, like an empress enthroned. It's a great emphasis on power, uh, cumulative power being presented to us. And of course, this is an image that we are very familiar with. Um, and I'm going to take us now, the last part of our journey, down into what is now Egypt, into Sinai down to the Monastery of St. Catherine. And why we're going there is because we want to just look at the iconic element. If you go back, this is like an icon, something we communicate through. And icons become a crucial part of Orthodox worship. However, as I mentioned earlier, in the eighth century, there is a movement against them, quite a puritanical movement, probably influenced by Islam, when it's thought that there should be no images of gods or saints or anything, no images of Jesus, no images of Mary, they should be gone. And it becomes a political movement, but a lot of destruction takes place. So the icons from this early period all disappear, get destroyed. But this monastery way down here in Sinai, in the middle of the desert, supposedly where Moses was, when he saw the burning bush, this is left in peace and isolated. And so we have some icons and manuscripts from St. Catherine's, which give us an idea of what things were like in this early Byzantine period. Here's the monastery and you can see it, it has got a little water bit here, but it's, it's pretty rough in the Sinai. Um, anyone been there? You have, how was it? Oh, but still, you wear that. You saw the burning bush, exactly. And just, just did you? Were you able to see um, any of the icons? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to look at now. Um, and here, this recalls the Theotokos songs. Uh, here she is, the Virgin bearing Christ, and. 
two important saints either side, Saints Theodore and St. George, um, our own Saint St. George. Done in, with wax and egg on caustic technique, heated wax. And notice that she is looking slightly that way, which is interesting. It shows it's an early icon. Later on, icons will look directly at you. And then the other side, Christ the ruler again, the Pantocrator. Um, this is a very interesting icon. And some believe it's deliberately trying to, through its right side, indicate God, and through its left side, indicate man. Now, we've no literal evidence for this, um, uh, literary evidence for this. This is just a supposition that this is actually what happened. But here he is blessing us. And this is the way that Byzantine art and a depiction of Christ is going to go. Christ is no longer this soft youth, the good shepherd. He's now the ruler, the controller of us all. And the Byzantine Empire itself, on the way its art develops, is absolutist in that sense. There isn't a free hand. There are ways of presenting things. Uh, the great French art historian, André Gravard, said, when you look at Byzantine art, you have to think about it as a piece of music that's been long composed. It could be Mozart, it could be Beethoven. And what you see is how the conductor, in this case, the artist, uses those components. So they musically describe it in a different way. But what you're going to get is essentially the same themes presented in roughly the same way. So it'll be quite subtle in terms of how it, it, it moves. But of course, we will see different styles as we go on. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. On the hour, I can't believe I've done it. I usually talk far too long. Um, but if you want more, Thursday the 19th of May is part two, which will be Middle Byzantine art. And then on the 9th of June, we're going to the late period, post 1204, and what happens to Byzantium then. Thank you very much. Any questions? Anyone dare to ask a question? Was there some time in Cordoba? 